All right. Hey, again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And for everyone joining us online, we're so thrilled that you've joined. I tried to dress as much like Rolando as I could today, but uh, getting close. Love him so much. So grateful for all that God's doing in our midst. It's just incredible. An opportunity to help our partners. I love the men of Nehemiah and all that they're doing there. So way to go, church. Many of you have stepped up and helped in big ways. Hey, let me ask you this. Have you ever been taught uh, to do something? And then only later to realize that you were taught how to do it the wrong way. If we had time to think about that, you probably would consider. I'm not talking about like learning something and having to learn it over. I'm talking about actually doing something and realize you were doing it the wrong way. Not like, you know, revisionist history in, in your history class and realizing later, oh, wow, that's not exactly what happened. Or, or realizing that Pluto is not a planet. What? Um, I'm talking about doing something. You know, it happens in sports sometimes. We're watching the... Maybe the World Series kicking in here soon. You're watching the playoffs. Like a pitcher who, who learns how to release a ball differently after many years or a golfer who learns how to rethink his swing or her swing, you know, in the off season. It happens. But, you know, here's today. We're going to be talking about something. I think we got it wrong. What we're learning throughout this series on the fruit of the Spirit is we think we've got it, but maybe not. And today we're going to talk about kindness and I think it might be that we've been doing kindness wrong. As I've looked in the scriptures this week, I'm realizing kindness is next level. It's something other than. And so with all of these fruit that we've been talking about, um, it seems that we, we're kind of going, hey, as if Jesus, you know how he, how he teaches sometimes, he'll say, um, you've heard it said, but I'm telling you this. So we got love down. No, I think not. You know, that's what's happening every week. Love, joy, maybe not peace. Last week, patience. I thought I was patient, maybe not. And I think it goes that way with kindness as well. So the passage that we're looking at more than any other passage uh, these days, two verses really, is the umbrella passage. And we find it in Galatians 5, verses 22, 23. Now you can see it there on the screen, but for those of y'all who want to go next level, graduate course kind of stuff, you can close your eyes and you can do this even now, right? So let's all say it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, today we're going to talk about kindness. And I want you to do this. We have a QR code there on the screen that you can look at, uh, that you can go to right now. Let's leave that up long enough if you'd like to go there now. It's also on our website. Uh, it'll be right there with all, with each sermon. You go to the sermon, find it, and then you'll have all these great resources there of questions you can ask in a small group, questions you can ask in your quiet time. What we're seeking to do here is to apply the Word of God every single week. Okay, not just hear a sermon, again, but actually dig deeper in your own personal quiet time, devotional time, and grow in the Lord. Okay, so just be aware of that. Every week we're pointing you there as, uh, as we, some of us are not able to get in our groups uh, together. But these are for smaller groups or in your connect groups. We've got groups that are launching with that material. All right? So, hey, yeah, today is, uh, is we're looking at grapes. Every week we're looking at a, a specific fruit that actually reminds us when we see it, when we eat it. Uh, in the case of the of grapes, we got grape juice, we got jelly, we got jam, we've got vinegar. We, all kinds of stuff comes from grapes. Grapes, uh, they come uh, in, in they're, they're small, but they pack a punch, right? Uh, we've said that grace then, or, or grapes and kindness is, is grace in the small stuff. Grapes come in a million ways. I didn't know this. There are 10,000 different kinds of grapes. I don't know if we knew there were grapes. Grapes can be white. They can be pink. They can be blue. They can be red. I've got some red grapes here. They can be, of course, uh, purple. We see grapes all over uh, the world and throughout history. They've been uh, kind, of, kind of produced uh, domestically, uh, cultivated domestically for about 6,000 years. So we see, it, we see them through the Bible. All kinds of uses for grapes. And they, they come in bunches. You know that too. I didn't know this. They could come as many as five. They can come as many as 300 in a bunch. We're talking about it comes in a million ways. But here's the thing. Kindness, I think, is, is underrated. And we know in this particular cultural moment, kindness, I think, just might be our superpower. 
Kindness is something that believers show, those who follow Jesus, uh, to look like Jesus. But what we're going to learn today is kindness is a lot more than kind of smiling a lot. It's a lot more than just being nice. We need a lot of that. It's more than just opening a door for someone, saying nice things about others. That, all of that is kindness. But what we see in the Bible is we get two words primarily for kindness in the Greek. The first word is philanthropia. Philanthropia, you can hear the word, do you not? Philanthropy, we get the word philanthropy there. A uh, philanthropist is someone who, it's defined this way, an affectionate concern for, in, for the interest in, for interest in humanity. An affectionate, so it, it's often someone who gives a lot of money, right? You might think of, I don't know, Bill Gates, I guess, a philanthropist these days, or others who give, and we, we need more kingdom philanthropists. Uh, that, that is, it's a biblical word, that's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. So some of us, many of us, even in our church, are able to give because God's blessed us so. We need more kingdom-minded philanthropists. As Rolando had noted, it's why the, the, uh, in Espanol, the, the, the Spanish-speaking ministry was launched. It was because of a philanthropist kind of giving uh, in a trust that was able to be used for that purpose. But there's another word for uh, for kindness, and it's a very Pauline word he uses all the time. It's Christotes in the Greek. Because what happens is I think oftentimes we can go, uh, okay, here's what kindness is. Like Jesus, you know, you've heard it said that kindness is being like a philanthropist, giving. Uh, don't get too close. Don't get too messy. Don't get up close and personal. Instead, just give, and, and you've done your part. But Christotes is a word that says, no, 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 no. Here's, here's what, and it's the word in Galatians 5. It's used for kindness, and it means complete and total uprightness in your relationship with other people. It means that you're right, righteous, just in every relationship that you're in. Everything you think about a person, everything you feel, everything you do, everything you say. So here's what it means. You do not, you don't dehumanize people. And think about this. Again, in our cultural moment here, you don't categorize people. You don't objectify meaning, meaning, meaning that, that uh, well, they're just an object. Like, like they don't even have a name. They're just those people. They're a, oh, and, and again, you know, right now, oh, they're a Republican, bam. I mean, they're a Democrat, no. You see, and what we do then, we objectify people. It, it happens uh, when we see like sexual harassment. We object when a, when a man or a woman, when a man objectifies a woman. As if she's not a person, but something instead to be used by him. It's having right thought and love, kindness towards every person, every layer of your life, every thought, every word you say, everything you, you, you do. Paul uses the word in Romans 2, verse 4, to kind of make my point. Watch this. This is next level kindness. This is like Olympic strength kindness. When we think kindness is simply just smiling, being nice, look at what he says. Or do you presume, do you assume, do you take for granted, do you just put it aside if it's, as if it's not anything amazing and awesome on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience toward you and toward me, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Now, now, when you think of repentance, I, I, I tend to think of some guy with a bullhorn over in the corner, standing up on a box somewhere, turn or burn, right? Repent, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I mean, Jesus said those things. John the Baptist said those things. Yes, we need to repent, but this says that there's this kindness that comes from God that leads to repentance. His love is to lead us to repentance, and we're going to see that this is the way it should be in our lives. He says, as God has done to us, we're to do to others. In fact, Ephesians 4.32, which is our, our memory verse this week, it says, be kind to one another. That's that word, Christotes. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. So it's just, he's qualifying this word, as God in Christ forgave you. As God forgives, we're to do the same. And so we thought it'd be great, our teaching team, Orlando and I, as we thinking through how can we talk about kindness. And so we thought this week we'd go to a narrative, just tell a story. In fact, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10. This is the uh, most popular story that Jesus ever told. You know what it is? Any, any thoughts? Anybody? What would be the most popular story that people know all over, over the world? It's the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, I heard this week on the news, literally, 
And now we have a story of a good Samaritan. And I think most people go, okay, somebody did something good for somebody. But I think that we've missed the point of the story. Like so many parables, Jesus wants to find ourselves in it, and he wants us to find him in it. And when we read it rightly, we go, "Uh uh-oh, wait, this is about me. This is about my life and about how I should live in relation to Jesus. And that's what we're going to see today. I think most Christians have missed the point of this story. Maybe it's why we're doing kindness uh, wrong. All right, so look at Luke chapter 10. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read, admittedly, a longer portion of of Scripture than normal because I want you to hear the story as Jesus would have told it to his first hearers. Now, it sets up in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to to the test, saying, so we see a little motivation here, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And he he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So he offers the Shema. He said, this is it, comprehensively. And, And Jesus, I mean, and he answered correctly. Jesus says to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Do this and you'll live. Remember his original story. How do you have eternal life? He says, do this. Do that. You got it. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, uh, who is my neighbor? He's kind of asking, really, what, what, so what's a neighbor? What, what, what is, what's a neighbor? And, and who? How far does this go? But Jesus replied. So then Jesus replied in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, using the language of the day, by chance, just happened a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on the man. And he went to him, and he bound him up, bound up his wounds, and he pouring oil and wine. and, And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him. And whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, "Uh, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, "Uh, you go, do likewise. He's like, yep, do that, you got it. But then look what happens next. We go from a lawyer to a living room. Look at verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. Or tell her then, like, you agree, right? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, the best thing, the one thing, which will not be taken away from her. Wow. So, Dr. Luke, guided by the Spirit of God, tells this story, writes this story. Then he jumps to this story in Bethany. And what I want to do is just now unpack all of this because there's a lot here. Have you ever been in a situation where you realize you were trapped? Like in a, in a contract or an agreement, you wanted to find a loophole? You ever done this? Like, oh, I'm stuck for months in this. How do we get out of this? Reading the fine print. Well, this is what the lawyer's doing. He's saying, hey, hey, who's, who's my neighbor? He's asking really, again, what, what is a neighbor? Now, I think we often think, well, this, this guy, he's, like, he's a Pharisee, law, legalist. I think he's a good guy. I think he's asking a good question. I think he realizes, watch this, it's harder to love, we, we can say it this way, it's harder to love people than it is to love God. And he says, so how do we reconcile this? How far does this go? And the text even says he's trying to justify himself. He's trying to say, I think I'm okay. But he's asked the wrong question. Did you catch it? His original question? Do you know that he's asked the wrong question? What must I, what? Do to have eternal 
life. So I understand this man's posture. Look at, in, in verse 25, he says, Behold, the, the lawyer, he's testing it. He says, What must I do? What must I do to have eternal life? I understand where he is. I mean, this is the question of life. This is what everybody in the world is asking. What do I do to get to heaven if I believe in such a thing? Or how can I have a Zoe life is what it was, the abundant real life. What do I need to do? So he's trying to get underneath it. He's trying to debate. I mean, I, I've done this. He's, he, he's thinking, well, Jesus, if I'm thinking straight about this, and this is a bright guy. He's, he's like, uh, there's a need. Does this mean everybody? Like I do this all the time. Does it mean for me, like, is it, is it my neighbor Tim next door? You know, is it, is, it, is it Mike over here in his family? Is it John across the street? I, I should start there, certainly, but then where, how far does it go? Who's a neighbor? How, how, how much do I need to do to justify myself before God? It, it seems like there's a lot here. And then Jesus answers this question by telling a story. He says, there's a man going down the main road. And he's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. We can assume that his original hearers would have thought, oh, this guy, he's Jewish. He's a Jewish man. He's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Well-traveled road. And I think the people would have listened, and this makes all the difference in the world. They're thinking, he's a Jewish guy. He's like me. He looks like me, acts like me, believes like me. He, he, here he is. So they, they, they see themselves here, and then he's robbed, he's stripped, he's beaten, he's left as roadkill on the side of the road. Now, the, the, you're hearing this, and you're going, wow, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus, like, he asked a legit question. Well, now, now you're like, this is like going, like, R-rated, I mean, this is graphic stuff. What? But they have no idea where he's heading. He's about to tell the most socially charged story he will tell in all his ministry. He can make everybody mad with this one. Because when you go there, you make everybody mad. Or at least everybody's got questions, and that's, what he's, that's why this guy's asking. So look what happens. There comes a priest. Oh, oh, this is good news. This is great news. Somebody's going to care for this guy. And he doesn't want to be bothered. He goes around on the other side. Oh, but, but then came a Levite. And he's, now he's offering, like the priest is like a Jewish pastor. And then the Levite, this is from the ancient tribe of, of Levi, where all the priests came from. These are the most respected people in their culture. And he says, then a Levite came by, and well, he, he didn't want to be bothered either. He just went on the other side, didn't even care for him. Guy's dying over here. Then came a Samaritan. Oh! Everybody there is like, wait, what? Where's this going? Jesus brings a Samaritan right in the middle of the story. And again, like in this cultural moment, this would be like, uh, can I say it? It'd be like Joe Biden, who's speaking to a group of Democrats, and he's telling a story, and then he says, and then came the Republican. Oh! It'd be like President Trump, you know, in a big rally, and he's speaking, he's telling a story, then he says, and then came the Democrat. Oh, he's not going there. Yes, he is. See, but even more so. I mean, these were all Americans that were really challenging these days with such division. But in this, in this story, the Samaritan, you probably know this. These are half-breeds. These are hated people. These are people who, who were, were isolated. You didn't even go through, the, through Samaria. You would travel around. You didn't want to talk to them. You didn't want to be with them. You beat them down. You berated them. You taught your kids to avoid them. You taught your kids to hate them. The Samaritan steps right in the center of the story, and people are going, what? Why is Jesus bringing that guy into this story? Here's why. Look at verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. He saw him. This is the same pattern. Saw him. And then here's where the pattern breaks. He had compassion for him, which means at the core of his being, he's moved. But I want you to see this. First thing I want you to see is kindness sees. Kindness actually sees. Sees the person in need that all are created in the image of God. Not, no, this is not my problem. You see, kindness has a right relationship with every person. I'm not above you. I, I'm not below you. We're all the same. And so look what he does. He's moved and he takes special care of him by buying costly medicines and oils and wines. Look how much of the story is detailing how he cared for him. Because that's what kindness does. 
He comes into small stuff. It, it, and he spends a lot of money for him. In fact, he, he says, I'm gonna, he pays for his hotel room. He, he stays with him all night to take care of him, to make sure he's okay in the morning. And then he says to the hotelier, the, the owner there, he says, hey, here, it's, it's in essence, here's my credit card number. Or hey, if there's any more needs that this guy, just, just Venmo me the rest. Uh, we'll take, I'll, I'll send it to you. We'll take care of him. We, I've got this. And I can imagine the innkeeper, I thought about this this week, the innkeeper's going, wait, is, that, oh, is this... Who is this? Is this like your brother? Is this a family? No. I was just, I mean, I was just on the way down here and he was, he was beat, dying. I, I just met him. I don't, I don't know him. Kindness sees. But don't you just see, kindness does. Kindness acts. Kindness goes out of its way to actually do something. See, this is why kindness is, yeah, it could be a smile. We need more smiling. We need a lot more kindness. But this story is so crazy. Everyone's like, this guy's asking a legitimate question. And now Jesus steps in and he, he then asks, so who proved to be a neighbor? You see how he twists that? Jesus says, okay, so, so who's, who's a neighbor? No, no, no. Just be a neighbor. Just, just be a neighbor and you've got this. The lawyer's response is not who was the neighbor. I mean, he doesn't say the Samaritan. Did you catch that? And that guy, the guy who the guy who took care of him, that guy. Like he didn't have a name. Doesn't he's not, you know, again, objectifying that guy, the guy who took care of him, had mercy on him. Now remember the original question. It goes all the way back to how can I be sure to have eternal life? And then Jesus tells this the most socially charged story. And he says, just do that. Do what the good Samaritan did. And watch this. Here's what he means. He doesn't mean just try that every now and then. Like, you know, every, not, not every time, but just, you know, every now and then do that. He means 100% of the time when you see someone in need, you take care of them. 24-7, all the time, show kindness to every person on the planet. And we're left to think that the, that the lawyer then goes, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. Really? Who, who can do this? To, to love and care for those who hate you, who oppress you, who, who put you down, who berate you, who ostracize you, who wish you would disappear, always correcting you, just want to uh, just dismiss you. Take, wait, love them like all the time. Care for them, act and, and move in a way. And I'm over here just trying to love people, just annoy me a little bit, right? I'm over here just like even people in my family who think like me, look like me, and we're struggling, right? But you're talking about people who constantly disagree with me. You're talking about people who, who every time I encounter them, it's going, okay, what's, what's wrong with me today? Like, you, you don't like my people. You don't like me. You don't vote like me. You don't think like me. You marginalize me, disregard me, despise me. Love that guy? Jesus is saying, yes, that guy. All the time. And here we would finish this message. Perhaps you've heard this story before. Or you, clearly you have. Maybe you heard it preached. We could wrap it up now. All right, let's pray. Y'all, go do that. Good luck with that. Let's go. Go do it. Or maybe do the best you can, like better than you have. We could end the message there. Let's have, let's have Good Samaritan Month. Let's all jump in. And let's do take care of the men of Nehemiah. Let's do enter into all that we can do for those at Vickery, all the, the, the challenges that they have, and we're going to be able to meet needs as we do every week, every day, and throughout Christmas. Yes, let's jump in. But is this really the way to eternal life? Did Jesus answer the question, what's, what, what's going on here? What is he talking about? This is like, this gets more, but watch, it gets more confounding. Because then we jump to the next story. Dr. Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, then writes this. He's, okay, the first story ends, go and do likewise. What? Like, he doesn't really answer the question if we understand Scripture. Maybe you think he is, like, work harder, get better, and good luck. But then we go to Mary and Martha. Now, Martha is working away in the house, getting after it. She is serving everybody. Mary's sitting there doing nothing. But listening to Jesus. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. So you tell me, who's the good Samaritan here? Who is actually taking care of everybody? 
It's Martha. It's not Mary. And so Mary steps up and she does what every, all of our, if you, if you have kids, you've heard this, right? Mom, dad, right? Or, or you don't even have to, they don't even have to call out your name. They're just like, right? We've all been there. If, you, if you're a parent and she's, she's grown up now, but she's still doing it, but who could blame her? She's getting out. And then Jesus says this, look at verse 41. He says, but the Lord answered Martha. And I, I hear kindness and compassion. And support. Martha, you're so anxious and you're troubled about many things. See, he basically says, no, I'm not going to correct her. I'm not, no, I won't call her out. Again, who looks like the good Samaritan? Martha looks like the good Samaritan. This seems to totally contradict the story before. So you're like, Jesus, which one is it? What, which is it? What are we doing here? And look at verse 42. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus says Mary's chosen the best thing in all of life. He's cho- she has chosen the best thing in human existence. To sit before love personified in person. Love is speaking to her. And she's taking it all in, you're wondering, how does this tie to the Good Samaritans? How do we reconcile these stories? Jesus says, be kind all the time. Go into great detail. Spend money on other people 24-7, 100% of the time. You think, well, do I just give everything, everything away? Do I just, I don't, what, I live out in this, am I become homeless? How, how do, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. It's impossible. And if, and if the lawyer was honest, if he said, that's, that's nuts. I can't do this. Nobody can do this. And Jesus would say, you're right. You're right, but he doesn't do it. Remember, Jesus says you're to love God comprehensively, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you do that, here's the point, Jesus is saying, you don't need me. You do that, you don't need me. The story, the story ends like a lot of parables where we're going, I don't even know what to do with this. And again, a sloppy exegesis in, not in light of all of Scripture would say, go do that. Get after it. Get busy. Work harder. Do better. This is, this is Jesus. This, Jesus. this is classic Jesus. Savage Jesus is saying to us, you live your life perfectly. Go do that. And you won't need me. But he's also telling this story so we find ourselves here. Let me ask you this. Who's the good Samaritan in the story? Who is the good Samaritan? It's Jesus. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Where are you in the story? I'm the guy who's been set aside. I'm the one who's got, I've been beaten by the stuff of life. I've been stripped. I've been shamed because of my sin. I've been put on the side. I'm over here dead in my trespasses and sins. I'm hemorrhaging out over here. I need life and I can't rescue myself. I need somebody to come along and help me. So the law comes along. The law's got nothing for me that can rescue me. Religion comes along, says, get up, man. Get up. I can't get up. I'm dying. I can't do anything. I need help. I need rescue. I'm powerless to help in this fallen, dying state. But Jesus, the good Samaritan, comes along. And in his loving kindness, in his grace, he sees me. And he does something. He comes to me. He comes and, and he, he gives to me. Though I'm, 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 I'm dying, he comes and he says, no, 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 I will give you the riches of my glory. I will buy you. I'll spend not just a couple of days' wage. I'm going to spend my entire life. I'm going to give my life. And he doesn't just help me out for a few days. He forgives me for all of eternity. He's the one who's been marginalized. Jesus is the one who's been labeled a sinner. He's the one everybody's challenging. He's the one who's beaten, belittled, berated. He's the one who's arrested. He's the one who's put to death. He takes on all of that. He takes on what should have been mine. And then he comes and he rescues me so that I can get up. And I can live differently. 
I can actually live with the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Fruit of the Spirit, kindness. I can actually do this as his Spirit leads me, friends. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Lawyer comes along trying to be smart, thinks he's asking a benign question. What must I do to to gain eternal life? Jesus says, if you can live a perfect life, you don't need me. Go at it. Try that. So, friends, how's that going for you? Seeking to live like the good Samaritan? No, no, no. The perfect Samaritan. You can go the way of religion. You can work as hard as you can. If you do that perfectly, you don't need a Savior. But if you can't, every person watching me online right now and every person in this room, you need a Savior. You need to come to Jesus. The the lawyer's thinking, is this a joke? What are you talking about? And he's talking about what he's done for us. If we recognize that we are dying, and he, he tells this story, he says, go and do likewise. Then we come to Mary and Martha, and Mary celebrated. What do we do with that? Again, here's what we do with this. She is right before, abiding in, if you will, perfect love. When you respond to the love of Jesus, you will sit at his feet. Here's what this means. Jesus says, you've heard the Ten Commandments, keep all those perfectly, you don't need me. But I'm going to add an 11th commandment. And so he says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another as I have loved you. So what does Mary teach us? She teaches us, friends, listen, we got to fix our eyes on Jesus. we got to fixate on Jesus. We need to abide in him. I'm talking about sitting before him. We need to think on his love for us. We need to swim in it. We need to be saturated by it. We need to live and be loved by him. And then out of that relationship, then we can become like the good Samaritan, like Jesus. The first we got to look at him. We've got to love him. We've got to be in his word. We've got to sit in his feet. Are you doing that in these days? You've got to get in a group. You've got, you got to reach out to us. Let us help you in these days. Sit before pure love and be kind to one another. I just want to challenge you. Be kind to your friends. Be kind to your spouse. Parents, be kind to your children. Be kind. Be kind to those who don't look like you, especially be kind. This is enemy love we're talking about. Kindness sees, kindness does, and kindness proves that you belong to him. So I want to close with this challenge. Do you know him? Back to Romans 2 verse 4. Have you been presuming on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience toward you? Not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. His great love for you, what he's done for you, is meant to turn you away from sin. To stop sinning. To stop the habitual sin. To stop trying to prove that you're good enough and turn to him. You say, yes, by faith, not by works. Praise be to God. But right now, by faith. And I want us to close with prayer right now. So I want you to just bow your heads, close your eyes, even at home right now, wherever you may be watching this. Just just bow your head and close your eyes. Friend, his kindness toward you should cause you to turn away from your little self-salvation project. It's not working. And you know it. You need a Savior, and he has come. Receive his grace even now. Turn and repent. Give your life to the one, the perfect one, who's given his life for you. Just say, Lord, come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. I repent of my sins. And whatever you need to do, who is it that you need to love this week? 
be set free just to love as he has loved you. Lord, we love you. We're drawn to your kindness. We go to be kind to others even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.